This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas and educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brown. The internationalization of education is a topic that receives plenty of buzz these days. Many students easily move across borders to learn outside of their home country. Branch campuses by many Western universities are popping up around the world, and education businesses operate globally, selling educational materials and services to any school willing to purchase them. But can the phenomenon of international education exist within sites where these practices don't clearly exist? My guest today is Fan Le Ha. She is a professor in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii. Her new forthcoming book is entitled Transnational Education, Crossing the West and Asia, Adjusting Desire, Transformative Mediocrity, and Neocolonial Disguise. Today, Leha and I discuss parts of her book, particularly related to the dominance of English language in many Asian countries. Leha will join Fazal Rizvi and Ratna Lau for a webinar on March 22nd to discuss the issues of higher education in Asia. To sign up for the webinar, please visit the Globalization and Education SIGS website. Space is limited to the first 100 people. Fan Leha, welcome to Fresh Ed. Uh, Hello, hello from Honolulu. You have a forthcoming book that looks at transnational education. Uh, And this topic is quite uh, popular these days. Transnational education is almost a buzzword. Could you begin this conversation by telling me what do you mean by the term transnational education? Um, Okay, yes. Actually, it is interesting that, uh, you know, when you mentioned that, it it is a a buzzword and so much has been done in relation to the topic. But I actually, I want to bring a different perspective. Yes, on the one hand, why... There, there has been so much written about transnational education. But my observation is that that much hasn't really, or, or, or I would say doesn't have much to do with scholarship. Um, so I, I feel What that, does it have to do with? Yeah, scholarship. It means that, you know, there is a missing part uh, rigor and a conceptualization uh, not so much about the term but about what is you know what is going on in that very uh, transnational space so uh, l- let's talk a little bit about definition there are many many different ways to understand transnational education and probably up to now, I would say that you know, one common understanding of transnational education or TNE um, often refers to any educational programs that have students from a country other than the one in which the awarding institution is based. And normally, there are three major modes of delivery in TNE namely distance education, partner support delivery, and a branch campus. Um, and the movement of programs across borders through all forms of delivery is perhaps one of the most significant aspects of TNE these days. And if the movement of people was emphasized in the initial stage of TNE, then the movement of programs is now the key idea. Um, however, what is covered in my book really extended, you know, uh, sorry, is extended to certain forms of exchange programs and short study tour programs where students can also be placed in a host institution, but they may not necessarily get credits for their exchange or study to a period. And in addition to the above, you know, I would say understandings of TNE, I really want to highlight and argue that English medium programs and courses offered by local institutions can also be seen as a form of TNE 
although their students are not earning degrees or qualification from any overseas universities. Why I, do I say that? Yeah, you know, in creating their own programs, many of these institutions often draw on existing programs, materials, course syllabi, and lectures from other English medium programs developed elsewhere. They also invite academics from other institutions to offer advice concerning the shape and content of their programs and curriculum. And in many ways, some institutions also contract a group of international academics and advisors to develop English medium programs that are perceived to be internationally competitive. And, right, and also many universities in Asia, for example, employ international academics who can teach and do research as well as to you know, develop courses in, in English and to, res to publish in English to meet the needs of an international student body. And, right, I, I mean, I can tell you many, many examples. And, and I think we'll get to the examples, um, but I'd like to just clarify, um, I guess when I hear the word transnational, I think something that is um, either above the national or uh, not necessarily between two inter-nation or national. So what's the difference between transnational education and international education? Oh, I, I think that's a great question. Actually, I haven't really thought much about it. But um, I think the chance here, I don't necessarily think that they probably, you know, international education or the term international probably had uh, been coined first and then chance as one mm. aspect of it. And, but normally for a long time, chance national often refer to, you know, the movement of people and then the movement of ideas that involve somehow you know, at least two elements. Um, however, as I have said earlier, many universities or programs or courses develop in Asia or based in Asia already embed or embody in themselves the chance or, in, or international aspect because they are, you know, they tend to borrow or I would say influence or they learn from ideas that have already de uh, developed somewhere else. So you don't have to be, you know, mobile to be chance national or to be in international. I don't know, you get what I mean? So. So you can you can be living in Cambodia or Vietnam and never leave your country, but still experience transnational education. Is that what you're saying? Right, and and even uh, if you live in Cambodia and if your university, if the university you are attending, you know, doesn't necessarily have any partnership with an with an international partner, I mean, a country or, or institution. But the programs you are taking can be as transnational or international as any programs develop in a joint partnership somewhere else. Can you explain that further, maybe through an example? Oh, okay. So, you know, in the context of Vietnam, right, for example, um, the mini, we have... Uh, something called the Advanced Program Initiative, launched by Vietnam's Ministry of Education and Training in 2005, uh, in which, and I think probably up to now, 23 Vietnamese universities have worked with a number of American universities to create programs for Vietnamese universities using so-called American modern methodologies, curriculum, curricular and instructional practices. And 
English, in principle, has been used as a medium of instruction in these programs. And students uh, attending these programs may not or even actually probably are not given or offered degrees from U.S. universities. But I would say that the nature of the, the development of these programs could be seen as a good example of transnational. And why would why would ministries and and universities in in say for example uh, Vietnam see this sort of internationalization as desirable? I think it is not just Vietnam, probably everywhere. Um, of course, of course, it was just one example out of out of many different countries. But why why would certain countries? Um, find it desirable to to internationalize their universities and governments and and governments promoting such processes. Yeah, you know, um, internationalization has been probably incorporated in the language of reform. You know, all kinds of reform, whether it is in relation to education or human resources. So. You know, it, it has become an in, indispensable part of a nation's vision. And also, you know, another way to look at it is, you know, the, uh, the processes of globalization. And so when, let's say, Vietnam looks at its neighboring countries, Thailand or Malaysia or Singapore, and, and picturing those countries as being so internationalized, then that created an internal desire to to want to be like them in a way. So, so I think you know that that desire is both internally driven as well as informed by you know what probably I will discuss later. You know as a form of a traveling um, phenomenon. So internationalization, for me, is a traveling policy, a traveling practice, a traveling discourse. And what do you mean by traveling? Okay. Um, so, so for example, you know, when, when something travels, Probably we can look at it in different ways, whether it it travels freely, it it, it travels without any um, sense of, I mean, resistance, or basically it is just something, um, you know, happens so naturally. But but in the context of chance national education or 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 internationalization, I would argue that the sense of traveling takes place in all these domains. Um, on the one hand, it's, to, it's very much welcome because internationalization, as I said before, can be internally um, driven. So, um, so Vietnam, for example, would reach out and want to learn from internationalization practices from other places. And therefore, the act of reaching out could enable internationalization practices to travel to Vietnam through different means, probably could be enforced by policies or different directives, or could be incorporated in different reforms, or could also a company, you know, expats or, uh, or, you know, embedded in practices of institutions for, uh, locally or through partnerships with foreign institutions. So, yeah, so, so um, at one level, it's a kind of happy traveling. But at another level, you know, a traveling policy probably, you know, I'm sure that you have done some work uh, with that as well. Um, can come for, um, can come from rather, I would say, 
uh, a global imposition of what might be seen as being desirable. Uh, for example, the concept of critical thinking, the concept of learner-centered education, uh, and in what way and how the internationalization of education would enable you know, the widespread of critical thinking as you know, a desirable part of higher education in many countries, for example. And so, of course, that traveling of those concepts through internationalization can be seen as highly being problematic and could come with a lot of resentment and, 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 and I would say complications. You know, because we all know that there are many, many different ways to view uh, learner center education. It is not an unproblematic, uh, I would say, a concept or, or, um, or approach to teaching or pedagogy. So, yes, so when such concepts travel through internationalization of education, I would say that traveling is not necessarily not necessarily smooth or, or free or free will, uh, but also you know with the um, increasing movement of ideas and and people across borders, uh, internationalization also travel with them, and so this way probably we have less control in in you know, the speed and the intensity of the act of traveling itself. And so, for example, you know, in many institutions, um, um, certain academic staff may initiate programs that are very much resemble programs in another institutions oversee that they have somehow learned from or trying to adapt. Um, however, you know, other academic staff within the same institution may not agree with that or may have never really been exposed to that kind of, you know, um, development of ideas or a program. And so we could see the, um, you know, different ways of doing internationalization taking place alongside, and sometimes they may, you know, there are different forms of conversions and diversion happening because of, you know, as I said, uh, just, just the different ways of looking at how, um, delivery of ideas or delivery of, um, you know, of what we might mean, inter um, we might term internationalization uh, is carried out. Let's, let's look at um, maybe one major area of the internationalization or the transnational education. And you've mentioned it a few times. It's, it's the prevalence of English medium instruction um, across many school systems in the world. So how did English or why did English take on such a privileged role? And, and I find it interesting in, in the Southeast Asian context um, that English is so prevalent, yet Chinese, which is a, a, a near neighbor, um, is, is not, ne not taught as often or is seen as, um, or is given the same status, I should say. Mm, okay. I, I think one uh, important reason is the already availability of English in certain parts of Southeast Asia, notably, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And, you know, as much as colonialism has been problematized and criticized, um, in the context of transnational education, colonial ties with Britain or with the U.S. You're right, tend to be celebrated when, you know, um, 
let's say, when an endorsement about uh, the advantages of being able to deliver courses and programs in English is needed. And uh, yeah, so, so, so again, probably as I said, uh, the first one, uh, the first reason m may relate to the already availability of English, but also, you know, English has become or, or has been understood by many as an international language, as a lingua franca, as a world language, and as a language of academic um, what, advancement or, or, for, uh, or language of inter, uh, intercultural and academic exchange. So that understanding of English has been informing and driving, you know, con the conceptualization policy, practice, and pedagogies of of, of education, particularly in transnational education, and so, um, and and even with that understanding, probably create has created an anxiety among countries and institution if they perceive, if their perception, or or if or if they somehow perceive that, you know, their level of engagement with English is not intense enough you know so so the sense of wanting to catch up via the medium of english is very strong and that in itself just makes english even more desirable more wanted i know that in, in cambodia the desire for english is tied to economic growth and prosperity and so there's there is this discourse of if only more students could learn English, Cambodia could participate in the global economy more and therefore would, you know, increase its, its mean national wage. Right. Definitely, you know, econ economic development or economic advantage has played a role in the spread of English, but at the same time, um, it's just the, um, I, I would say, the conscious investment in English um, is also evident across the board. Um, by whom? Yeah, I mean by, by government, by policy makers, by institutions, and by uh, individuals yeah. in societies. When probably, you know, when um, there are indeed many examples of so-called success. Uh, you know, if you are, I mean, probably in the literature that I have reviewed, you know, Singapore has often been um, referred to as a, one of the uh, most successful example of internationalization of education or, or, or of transnational education. And English has always been, you know, um, emphasized as Singapore's advantage, comparative advantage. And so even within the context of Singapore, the debate uh, between, you know, Singlish or speaking good English movement, yeah, all play a role in, um, in positioning Singapore Kind of like in what way English really uh, shaped Singapore's identity, and what English, whose English, and and let's say without the perceived good English, would Singapore still be as attractive as it has been towards international education or towards other nations as? a hub for international education. So of course, English definitely plays a very important role in, I would say, in the competition and as well as collaboration. A lot of collaborations have been taking place via English. And, and even within Southeast Asia, right? I mean, you mentioned before, like uh, Chinese language in Asia in, in general, but even within the context of Southeast Asia, uh, we would think of Malay as, you know, maybe as a lingua franca, but the working language of ASEAN is English. So, 
so a Viet so <laughs> when an institution from Vietnam visit an institution in uh, you know let's say in um, Brunei or in Malaysia English is often used as a medium of communication what do you think the dominance of this the dominance of English what what does this do to the national cultural identity in these countries what is your research uncovered um, yeah there have been a lot of discussions about the impact of the dominance of English on questions of national and cultural identities in Asian context. Um, and I think, according to my own research, as well as the already published um, literature on, on this topic, there is no one simple answer to it because, you know, the different countries in the region has a different historical relationship with English and, and with different historical and social um, attachment or, or cultural attachment to the language um, as well to the, you know, to the many other languages available uh, in those countries. You know, um, whether the concept of identity has been seen in a negative or positive light, you know, uh, has been, I think, has been discussed a lot. There are different uh, associations with English, so um, at the national level, yes, there has been concern and anxiety, but when you talk to different individuals and different, uh, you know, um, and, and when you're engaged with different discussions within a society, then you can see more layers to it. So this from the symbolic to a more realistic. And so identity is very complex. It's not just, uh, not just you know, something that people across the board shared. So the national narrative of identity in the context of internationalization of education and in relation to English may not be shared, you know, in the same way by stakeholders or by participants of the internationalization of education. Your your new book um, looks at these these different transnational um, education processes or phenomena as they cross the quote unquote West and quote unquote Asia. What sort of dichotomies or what sort of crossing patterns have you uncovered? Um, okay, so actually before working on transnational education context, I've done a lot of work, or, or I would say alongside with work with paying attention to transnational education context. I have also been working a lot uh, you know, in so-called English-speaking Western country context, and I've I've identified a lot of I would say repeated dichotomous understandings of so-called West and Asia manifested in series of relationship, you know, um, between two seemingly uh, exclusive uh, populations, such as uh, Western professors, Eastern or Asian students, Western methodologies, or, or Western um, learning style and teaching style, and Asian teaching and learning style. Yeah, so in other words, there have been many, I would say, uh, generalizations uh, developed based on these two uh, grand uh, philosophies associated with the West and Asia per se. And so when I do more work in transnational context, I find probably the exact same uh, generalizations. And so, you know, these 
uh, it could say generalization or stereotype or essentialization of, of, of the West and of Asia, you know, um, in almost every um, transnational context and setting, as well as, you know, in every probably um, in, in the way the sector operate and in the way the sector has been promoted, in the way the sector kind of asserts itself as, you know, as a, um, probably as a key um, development for the future. So um, do you want me to talk more or to give you specific examples? Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Okay. So, uh, so for example, you know, um, what so-called Asian students in transnational education tend to be seen as lacking critical and analytical thinking and ability. And at the same time, um, Asian teachers employed to work in to work in transnational programs are also or tend to be perceived as lacking necessary knowledge um, and skills, you know, um, in comparison to their Western counterparts. So that, you know, you've seen that a lot repeatedly and, and where's the evidence? Of course, the, the evidence is in how the students themselves describe their programs, describe their own teachers, and, and also in the way teachers themselves talk about, talk about them and talk about the colleague, their, their colleagues, and also evidence in how certain you know, um, administrators uh, talk about their own institution and the desire for improvement that they hope to be done via the West. So are you saying that the stereotypes of the West and the East is being confirmed in the data that you're collecting? Yeah, very much so. And you, is, it, is it more complex than that, or is, is that... Um... It, that's the main finding. Oh, of course, it's a lot more complex than that. You know, um, at first, I was very tempted just to look at them as discourses. But as the, you know, as probably after about 10 years visiting different research sites and meeting with different groups of participants and being exposed to uh, and also attending many site visit or site observations and then i have to ask myself is it a real discourse or actually is the reality um because you know at the same time the increasing commercialization of higher education via transnational education, for example, right, probably has created more problems that would somehow justify the stereotype about the so-called the Asian learner or Asia itself. You know, now, when more and more English medium programs are created, and make it so probably <laughs> easy, I would say, rather easy for anyone to want to, I don't know, to have a different experience of, of education, to, you know, to, to be able to, to get enrolled and, and do, the, and, do uh, and pursue education. And probably, you know, Many of them are not ready for English medium education yet. I don't say that they are incapable, but probably not yet ready. 
um, and, and that is not my own perception, but the interview data with teachers, teaching in those programs, with administrators, uh, managing those programs, or even with students attending such courses, they all, uh, I, I wouldn't say all, but a lot of them admit that they shouldn't where, be where they are, or that, you know, universities shouldn't um, just let those courses run for the sake of generating incomes or for the sake of projecting themselves as being international or internationalized. Uh, and so, right, so the, I would say, the border or the boundary between whether stereotype about Asian students or Asia and the West are merely discourses in I think probably needs to be <laughs> questioned a lot when the commercialization is getting intensified and lends a hand to to kind of to confirm such stereotype. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. And so in your new forthcoming book, you've spent a lot of time thinking about transnational education. Um, particularly in the Asian context, um, what would you say is the main conclusion that you can come to? I, I would, uh, I would definitely want to argue that the the mediocrity embedded in transnational education, as well as the increasing desire for the West or Western knowledge or even the idea of the West have been um, contributed a lot or even largely by many institutions and individuals in Asia themselves. Uh, because in many, many contexts and settings the West, so-called the West, is missing. You know, I mean, sorry, a physical West is missing. Just only the idea of the West is, um, is I would say, is visible and entertained. But all the conversation and even the act of teaching, the act of learning, all takes place between different groups of students and individuals across Asian countries. But the idea of the West, it's just so strong. And, right, and so when Edward Said's work in Orientalism um, has been um, referred to or, or engaged with by many scholars to deconstruct uh, Western superiority or, you know, Western hegemony of, you know, of everything, then I see that very West uh, Orientalism being alive and kicking and leading its separate life in transnational education context. And probably, I would think, in many, in many ways, you don't need the West to tell everyone that, look, hey, you guys have to like me, you know, uh, we are the best. You don't need that for Orientalism to be alive. And so, um, and, and, and to be fair here, I'm not in any position to make moral judgment, but I, but, but this probably finding um, pushes me to reconceptualize the, you know, the relationship between the West and Asia, particularly 
in relation to the scholar, the de-westernization and de-imperialization scholarship that often attributes a lot of critics towards the West or the hegemony of the West and present, and at the same time presents Asia as more or less, you know, a victim. But the findings I've, you know, I've discussed in my book doesn't project Asia as a victim. Actually, it, <laughs> Instead, it, it really shows that Asia is full, uh, fully aware of its decision. It's something that it wants to do. It wants to identify itself with. And it does it with awareness. Um, and so maybe that very aspect of the relationship, um, I hope, would shed some new light into how we s understand internationalization of education, understand education, and, and understand um, different elements shaping and driving um, these domains. And, and again, I, I am fully aware of the limitation associated with all the terms the West Asia or, you know, and, and, and of course, I, I don't, I, I find it really limiting and totally just unhelpful to only see the West, so-called the West, as being hegemonic and being imposing because, you know, that agency associated with someone who could impose, in this case, as I show in my book, lies more with Asia itself. Fan Le Ha, thank you very much for joining Fresh Edit. We look forward to your new book. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Will. Fan Le Ha is a professor in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii. Her new book, Transnational Education Crossing the West and Asia, Adjusted Desire, Transformative, Mediocrity, and Neocolonial Disguise will be published by Routledge later this year. Next week, I speak with Rajni Naidu about competition fetish inside universities. Fresh Ed is brought to you by the Globalization and Education Special Interest Group of the Comparative and International Education Society. You can subscribe to Fresh Ed on iTunes and follow the show on Twitter using the handle at Fresh Ed Podcast. The opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not CIES or the Globalization and Education SIG, which take no institutional positions. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Priming. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and see you next week.